Pencil Kings, 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 Pencil Kings. Definitely do do it, but um, uh, keep your head about you and make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons. All right, we are back. This is the Pencil Kings podcast, and today we are talking with Jake Mengers. Did I get it right? You did. I did. And so... While you're listening, if you're at a computer, I encourage you to just go over to brava.com, B-R-U-V-V-A.com, and check out some of the amazing work that Jake has done. I was just talking to him before we started about the – and while you're watching, just appreciate some of the small, subtle nuances in the, the character animation, the animation in general that he's – that's in his work. Um, so I, I set that up. Welcome to the call, Jake. Why don't you tell people – uh, give them a sort of like a, just a one minute overview of what you do now, and then we'll get into the story of, of how you got there and sort of like the the things that we were talking about beforehand. Yeah, great. I think I'm largely at the moment I'm focusing on on directing uh, mainly TV commercials. Um, I work also as a creative director for um, well, for I can luckily I'm able to pick and choose the jobs as they come at the moment, but I try and make sure that it's always something of good value and um, of, of, of a lot of interest for me, and, and try and focus really on the directing side of it. They, I have um, contracts with both artists and uh, advertising, so I do stuff that you may see in an art gallery, and I do a number of stuff that you would only see on television. Um, and that basically is what happens during my days at the moment. Perfect. Okay, so where I want to start this conversation, because you said something that I thought was really interesting, and it's advice that I give to a lot of people, and a lot of people give this advice, so it's, it's not just exclusive to me. But when someone's starting out, you say, well, find somebody that's doing the thing that you want to do and reach out to them and, and ask them and see what it's all about. And so when you started your career, you did this. You reached out to a bunch of 3D artists, and you found somebody that, that told you not to get into 3D, right? Absolutely, yeah. I said... Um... Well, at the time, there wasn't an awful lot of 3D around. So this was 1993 or 4 that I was first looking into it and um, had done a sort of course to try and learn a bit of, uh, at the time, it was called Alias Power Animator. Maya and all of that hadn't yet arrived on the scene. And I was phoning around lots of companies to try and find out who actually had this software because even that was kind of hard to find. And, um, and on doing that, I phoned up a company. I spoke to a guy who very strongly advised me not to do it. And, um, and it stuck with me, actually, because uh, I would say that, luckily, I managed to forge a career out of it and, um, and have enjoyed the majority of what I've done. But um, there's no question that it can get the wrong side of you and uh, get the better of you. But you just have to be, um, be on your toes and make sure that you're pursuing ultimately your goals and not necessarily uh, the goals of a financial gain and all of that sort of stuff because there is a, an awful lot of catching um, catching out to be done when uh, working in the advertising trade and stuff. Ultimately, the work and really good work is hard to find. And um, so in pursuit of that, I think it's worth sticking true to yourself and uh, not being persuaded into taking something that's not necessarily a, a what you're after basically and do you remember what some of his main reasons why he said don't do it was it the the long hours the the pay that's maybe inconsistent or not the best or it's a bit of all of that actually and i think um ultimately i think it was very early days so his vision of the future for that industry uh, was probably quite close to where we're at now and it just took a lot longer to happen than it really did i think he saw foresaw the sort of oversaturation of artists uh, within the industry and uh, the huge amount of work that was going to come through. And in that, in, in that process, it basically, as the world and the, the software became cheaper and the world had more access to it, the more and more animators appear on the scene who are not necessarily really studied and learned their trade in, in to the same level that um, other people might. And it 
saturates the industry often with sort of um, people who are potentially more cost effective to the big businesses that are hiring them, but not necessarily as, as effective as animators on the actual software. So it creates a sort of discrepancy between what one might consider a true artist as an animator or someone whose real goal is ultimately just to get on the credit list for Star Wars and uh, go and tell mom, you know? Yeah, and just to put that in, an, in another way, I, I forget who had told me or if I read it in a book, but they were, had this analogy that there was the famous sculpture, sculptors like uh, Michelangelo um, and then if you go and, and you, you're walking around Rome, you see all these amazing sculptures that were made by now, I guess, nameless artists who are, we'll just call them craftsmen or artisans or whatever. Um, and there's a difference between the two of them. And for me, I always felt like I was part of the more craftsmen, that I was learning these um, these 3D tools to be part of a larger production. But I can also appreciate the, the genius level thinkers that are coming up with like setting the standard, setting the bar, the, the, we'll just call them the quote unquote true artists. And I feel like it's an important distinction. And if you know which side of the fence you fall on, um, I, I would be very happy to work under a real artist to help them realize their vision because now there's so much time that is involved in some of these things. It's really difficult. Yeah, I think, that, you know, it's a very good point. And I think, you know, you do get your workers and your sort of your leaders and, and that sort of stuff in the industry. That's definitely a fair point. And there's nothing wrong with, with being happy to be a worker and in that way and, and to help it through. And in fact, I, you know, in many instances, I've relied heavily on these people. So um, I think for me, I just felt that um, I fell into it through a desire to really want to... Um, create some really amazing stuff, I think, and that it was an art form that sort of found me as well, and that uh, it's not necessarily always considered an art form nowadays, and it's, it's very much something that people feel they can go to a, a college and just sort of learn for a couple of weeks and then be an animator or, you know, because they can use the software, and I think that's very different to be able to be just to be able to use the software and to actually really make that software work for you, to be able to push the boundaries and um, create something that one would hope hasn't been done to that level before. And so for you, I get, it's, it's really interesting because I, I feel looking at your work, it's very obvious that you're on the other side of the fence of where I was more of a, as a craftsperson. But how do you look at the world or like what do you think was different when you were starting out that allowed you to have this vision, this high, like these higher standards or I don't know if higher standards is the right word, but I mean, there's I, something I different. As a worker, there's no doubt about that. And, um, you know, probably the majority of the time I felt like it, that was the way. I mean, it was often the way it had to be. The hierarchy of, was such that, you know, your senior people, not necessarily senior through talent, but senior through uh, longevity in the industry, mm -hmm. was the way. And that, um, you know, it isn't always talent that, that steps people um, apart from them. So for me, it was... Um, yeah, no, I spent an awful lot of time um, working very hard. I think the difference was back then was that um, there was very few people. I know when I started in the industry and I started at uh, MPC back in 95, um, I think there was six. I think I was the seventh person to join the 3D team, whereas now I think there's probably about three, four, five hundred of them. Um, and so the people that joined there were what we call now sort of generalists. They were people that could or would have a go at everything and anything and they um you really needed to there was no sort of niche that you fell into you couldn't just come in and just be a lighter there was no place for someone who was just that at the time you needed to be able to pick it up model rig light render animate the whole thing and so i think you find an awful lot of um there's a lot of interest to be found by exploring all of these different avenues at the time i was I, I liked doing an awful lot of animation, but at the same time, the company would hire me a lot for lighting and rendering. Um, and I found other businesses that would hire me as a lighter, uh, sorry, as a, an animator. And I would sort of go between the different industries under slightly different guises, you know. So it allowed me to really learn the trade as such in a way that um, I felt 
uh, as a general generalist that one could go away and um, potentially fall into any aspect of it and try and make something of it. It doesn't necessarily mean I was very good at all of them, but I think that that comes in time that you sort of learn where your strengths really are. I think the thing with 3D animation is that it, it would make a mockery of people's talent in the film industry to think that one person could not just light a whole scene and, and render a whole scene, but design the costumes for a whole character and, um, you know, animate the whole character, which is ultimately acting. You know, when, also, when you look at a film crew and you have incredibly talented individuals that would just, just light, mm -hmm. people would just do costumes, people would just do makeup, you know, and there you are thinking you could just create all of these things yourself. And it, it really sort of undermines that process. And I think that there's just think that there isn't an art form within each one um, it would be crazy and so in pursuit of uh, I guess ultimately trying to do nice work um, you you find your niche as it were and um, along the way you sort of drop the bits that don't work so well for you and and but but what does come from it is when it comes to moving into sort of creative direction or leading teams of animators and lighters and renderers is that you have a little eye on all of the aspects which you've learned along the way. Um, and I think nowadays it's very hard to do that because people, the industry is saturated and people are looking for just a lighter that will come in and especially on feature film work, they sort of are restricted within the, the buttons they're allowed to press and they're allowed to only bring in scenes and lights that are pre-created for them so they're all that they're doing is sort of rotating the lights and setting the intensity and making it look nice and and believe me they do some amazing work but it it's less creative i feel that the boundaries are slightly closed and it's a bit more of a sort of um uh workshop machine room as it were a sort of production line um and and those early days of ex really exploring all of the different areas and trying it all was, was, was the most fun part of it for me and it's what really inspired me to carry on. I think if I'd come into the industry in 95 and been told that I could just light this bit and only use the uh, proprietary tools that allowed me to do that, I think it would have taken me about a week before I went off and <laughs> <it wasn't> me. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, it's changed a lot but I think there's a lot of opportunity as well and there's I talk about it from my experience uh, within London scene, but there's a huge amount of talented people across the world who don't have that feature film um, focus that drives all of these animators to flock to London to actually work on these things. And uh, there's a huge amount of boutique places around around the world that have uh, incredibly talented, talented people who still... Um, work in that way, I think, and, and I think that that really shows when you, when you work with these people. So, I'm trying to think of the best question to ask to really capitalize, to use kind of a trite term, on all the experience you have, and I know that um, I just talked to someone recently about this idea of storytelling and how storytelling is so crucial with the, you know, I'll use air quotes here, the artwork that you're doing and that no matter where you are, if you can start to incorporate more elements of story into what you're doing, the better off we're all going to be because it's very easy to produce something that's static and uninspiring. Um, but when you start to inject these elements of story, all of a sudden you're now letting the viewer interact with the piece that you're creating and letting them fill in some of the gaps or, or create a larger story than you maybe have envisioned yourself. But what are some things that, or, or do you have any, not frameworks, but elements that you feel are important for the storytelling aspect in the work that you do that maybe is just a thinking point that somebody who's listening could start to think about how, you know, knowing how you approach your, your work and, and all the experience that you've had, that they could start to think about stories in their own work and, and not necessarily to, to copy or to follow the similar footsteps, but just start to think more um, uh, intentionally about incorporating story into their own work. Yeah, it's a good question. It's a hard thing to sort of put, put a finger on. Um, 
it's certainly difficult within the advertising world to really push through a story because often you're sort of um, crowded out by uh, you know a lot of people that just want to push the brand and the product and and all of that sort of stuff when you actually want to kind of wrap it into a nice bit of narrative and um, it's about I think being true to yourself to in terms of sticking to your guns you know I think where you've got to really stand up for yourself it's a tough industry advertising where people are very opinionated and and often far more experienced than you are and I think you just need to try and um, you know, believe in your goals it ultimately. It's also about collaboration. Like, you know, I find that I, I certainly don't come up with all the ideas for the story myself. There's no way. So I'm looking to listen in on conversations of other people and certainly, you know, if a creative director from an agency is talking about a certain aspects of it, see what you can glean from that to actually help you along the way. There's no suggestion that you could potentially do it all. I, I feel that I have a huge amount of support and a good support network that enables me to be able to to create these things and um, I, I don't want to undermine that in any way because I certainly couldn't do it without them. I, I have a fantastic storyboarder I work with, Adrian Marlow, who um, you know is, is just amazing some of the stuff he does and I really really rely on him to, to be able to tell the stories and help me tell the stories and, um, and even the clients you know it's had some really good ideas come from a client who's, who was a pharmaceutical person, for example, you know, and they just sometimes see it from a different way, you know, because you're ultimately making something for the public eye, and, and these people are basically the public. They're not animators, so you're, you're seeing it from, they're seeing it from probably how the public would view it, and it's a really valuable viewpoint. So um, when making these things, uh, I'm talking primarily about advertising because it's really become my focus now. Um, and the storytelling in an advert can be tough. Um, I think what I try and do is try and work out what the character is prior to creating it. So uh, an example would be the superhero character. We had a very clear idea of this sort of fallible superhero. This was his, his thing. And we have to be very, um, you know, stick to that so that we all understand. We don't want to, we're not mocking him. He's, he's a fun person, but we shouldn't be laughing at him. We should be laughing with him. And I think if you get your the, the sort of key elements to each character down on paper and whenever a new chapter or a new story is coming in, just make sure that it's within your sort of guidelines that you've created at the beginning. And, um, and, and then in the same way, the character design. I think we need to, you know, at that stage, that's when they sort of come up with the characteristics of somebody and the, um, we sort of piece together a little character profile and that can often really help your storytelling stay sort of on the money all the way through because you can refer back to it and just check, you know, because there's often times where I've been pushed to sort of do something that isn't really within the character and you just have to really push back and try. I've been very lucky that um, working with people that occasionally listen to me so um, <laughs> <laughs> and that's allowed me to sort of really keep some of this stuff I also work very closely with actors on my animation so I'm not relying entirely on animators to be the actors which is ultimately what animation is and um, a technique that I use is often to film an actor performing the part or certainly if I'm doing a character that uh, is talking, I would film the voiceover character and use that as very close reference for all of the stuff I do and then fiddle the nuance of character to the actual design or to the uh, creature that it may be. So obviously you don't want to be overly humanize a, a squirrel, for example, because ultimately it needs to be a squirrel. And it, it, you've just got to play this balance. And the storytelling, I think, sort of comes through on its own. I don't Feel, well, I mean, my storyboarder, I think, is probably my most reliable person to go to to ensure that my story is working. Um, I value his opinion hugely, and I think building a team around you of not just animators, but right from the very start, the storyboarders and even the script writers and getting involved in that process will make you have a big involvement in keeping the story true right through the process.
So one of the follow-up questions that I have to that and where I see a lot of people trying to sort of run before they can even crawl is the whole idea of the pre-production that I'm wondering how – I really like the idea of having – constraints or guidelines for what your character is and maybe also what your character isn't you know you you talked about the fallible hero is as good as reference for me um and it's it's often sort of undermined really and i think it's it's, it's useful to throw in things that really aren't what it should be as much as things that are I and mean, then within that you find your your path it's a, it's, a, it's a good point and so i'm i'm curious how much time you're spending because I feel like uh, the natural inclination would be if you wanted to make a let's just say any kind of animation would be all right well you have your characters so you write out well there's a guy and there's a girl whatever very simply then you write down the the very simple scenario maybe two or three paragraphs then you write some dialogue okay now you're right into animation and I feel like that you could do that but that's not necessarily the way that's setting you up for the potential, I don't think that you're always going to hit it, but this genius level work or this very, very high quality that we we all want to be there. We all want the accolades of being able to tell stories that people can really relate to and that potentially move them. Um, but how much time are you spending, uh, maybe like as a percentage, in that pre-production phase where you're really thinking intently about this character and who they are and who they aren't and um, maybe even before you get to script writing or before you, and also too I think it's really important this idea of of filming the actors before you do the animation too that I see a lot of people just jump right into the no reference at all it's like wow no like no wonder this was so difficult you were trying to just invent all this stuff from your head which it's just not how it's done but yeah Valid. I think advertising itself, the industry, because of all the deadlines and the push and uh, budgets, it, it's kind of encouraging you to, to just rush through it, you know? And it's a big battle constantly to try and uh, make this time available in your schedule. And certainly within um, the job schedule, rather than, you know, you can stay up all night thinking about it, but it's about whether the job allows you to actually impose these kind of time frames on it because more believe me there's an awful lot of work I've done that I don't think would fit in this thing I just don't put it on my website <laughs> there's not um there's no you know there's plenty of stuff that will not allow you this kind of time but in 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 many instances too and certainly when an agency or client uh, has a lot of trust in you they really allow you to do that and um I think the I uh, probably as a percentage it's very hard to say but in terms of the thought process in my head, the percentage is huge. So when I get a job, um, I'm really struggling personally to actually get it all sorted prior to the fact, uh, prior to the point at which we're going to put pen to paper, as it were. Um, and I spend an awful lot of thought time getting these sort of things clear in my head. I'm not a great artist personally, as, as in a, a draftsman. Um, I can draw much better on a computer where I can rub <laughs> it out constantly. Um, but uh, uh, it's I, I work and working very closely with people who are incredibly talented. So I think I would say in my head it's probably 50-50. So I would prepare it mentally and really get it straight. And it's the same for anything, even writing a treatment right at the very beginning of getting a job where you're being sent a script and you need to um, try and bring something to it. It's no good just spieling out a whole load of blurb, which is ultimately um, repeating back to your client what they've written to you with a bit of sort of glossing on the edges. I think that's all too easily done. And I sometimes really struggle to the point where I just can't even start putting pen to paper because it's not clear in my head. And, um, and only when it is, do I actually then start? And often the treatment and the brief at that point will come out very, very quickly. And uh, uh, I think for me that's, but I know that's very different for other people, but for me that's a big part of it is, is the thought process beforehand um, and certainly discussing it and batting your ideas around different people. So I would uh, 
things that are funny to me aren't always funny to everyone else. And I think that's the same for everybody, you know. So it's important to run your little thoughts and, and humor past people and just see their reaction and, um, and be prepared to make changes and adapt stuff so that it's um, a bit more user-friendly, as it were, because you could just make right things that make yourself laugh, but it's not really going to necessarily make other people laugh. And that's the same, I would say, for... Uh, in some ways, doing that for an agency in, in advertising is the, the only way it works because there's so many people involved in the process and it's about collaborating with them and finding a sort of happy medium through the process that doesn't ultimately damage your story or your script or your character or your ideas. Um, but yeah, it's hard. I have to say, I, there's an awful lot of work I've done I would not say fit into that <laughs> category at all. I guess the last question that I have uh, is that I'm really curious what you see um, coming up on the horizon and what you're personally excited for. Um, and, and just to, to frame this, uh, my world was video games and your world is advertising or, or a lot of your world is. And for me, video games started to feel very stale that we've been watching video games on a box since the beginning, holding a joystick in our hands and the boxes have gotten better and faster and the joysticks have gotten more complicated but it really has been the same thing for since the beginning and what i'm really excited about now is this whole uh, virtual reality technology that the, the oculus rift and some of the other ones that are coming out that finally the medium is changing to this more immersive experience and to me it's it feels sort of like that beginning of 3d or 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 I could draw some analogies because the, the medium has changed. The, the rules, there's no one has figured out the per, – well, I guess production pipelines have sort of been figured out. But the storytelling way, the way that you tell the stories and the possibilities, it's like this blank book. And people are going to write new things that we haven't in, imagined before. And it's so exciting. Um, yeah, I completely agree. I think that VR and all of that – and there's bound to be more to come. I still think we're almost – we're still sort of – the, the dawn of that and uh, and it's often used much like 3d was when it first came out as you mentioned it's, it's a bit of gimmicky you know and you see a lot of the same sort of stuff out there but i think at some point someone will break through with something really truly amazing and some amazing adaptation or or use of this software i've seen some really cool from vr stuff but i still feel it's not quite there um I think for me what's exciting, I, I mean, I actually do a lot of stuff that isn't TV advertising. I do a lot of artwork, and I find pushing the boundaries there has um, is, is been really exciting for me. I've done some pieces, one piece in particular, that, um, that took me three years to make, um, which was a painstaking sort of study of a bouquet of flowers that opened and closed and that went from day to night, and the whole thing was a completely transforming digital piece of art that um, it kept people where you would normally walk to a gallery and look at a picture for, I think the average is about four <laughs> seconds people would study walking through a gallery. And this changed it to sort of more like four minutes. It was a, th a three hour long film and people would keep coming back to it. And uh, um, it was really satisfying also to do something that had that sort of longevity. You know, people buy art and it goes into galleries and you expect it to be there or be available to view for many hundreds of years. And I think that's quite exciting. It, I work for these artists called Rob and Nick Carter who have a, a really amazing um, sort of uh, series they're doing called Transforming, which where we're exploring all sorts of ways of bringing art to life. And uh, it's something I've really enjoyed doing. And I feel like there's a big future in, in that because traditionally going to galleries and things has been um, quite a sterile process. And that, I think, it combines with VR. I think they all start to overlap a little bit, and it really starts to open up the world for us because the, the thought that our kids would... Um, I, I just think it's amazing how they're going to view the process, having been born into this. And um, I feel a little bit of a sort of dullard when it comes to VR. I'm not even sure quite how to deal with all this <laughs> tech, you know? So... Um, I can't wait for some of the youngsters to come through and really show us with their imagination quite what can be done. I think you're right. It's going to be very exciting. Um, I'm not sure that my generation, certainly not me, is capable of doing that even. I'm not sure I've got that uh, 
enough of that natural thought process and certainly I have no coding experience. I would, I feel if I'd come into the industry a slightly different way, that would be something I'd love to have explored, I think. Um, but no, it's definitely exciting. I think that 3D as an art form has got a lot of life. I always also feel that, I feel the industry at some point is going to also implode where um, people will start to go back to the sort of the fact that they want to create amazing things and um, the, it's a, I don't know quite sure how to say it, but I think the industry is almost saturated with uh, talent and a lot of it's um, sort of talent that's been sort of school trained, not necessarily uh, trained through um, the love of the art and their ultimately pursuing their goals. I feel like it's a sort of, it's a, it's a kind of career, much like working in a bank is for many people. And um, I feel that that's going to, at some point, reach its conclusion. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe within there, there's some, a big future for the sort of the true artists in there to really shine. Um, there's an awful lot of uh, sort of, there's a lot of opportunity there that I think is being um, sort of taken away from people by uh, very rigid guidelines and very strict uh, proprietary use of software that isn't really expanding people's minds in the mm. same way. And I hope that that, um, that comes to an end, really. Um, and also the, the, the budgets and things. It, it's an industry that's struggling to really get the necessary credit for what we do. And then you look at things like, you know, all of the kerfuffle that went on with Life of Pi and the uh, sort of lack of appreciation for the real art that went into it on the 3D side. And um, I, you know, at some point that's, um, it's a sort of difficult, it's a bitter pill to swallow really, because I know these people work so hard for it. And, and what you get at the end of it really is an appreciation for what you've done. And so, to not get that is is quite devastating. I think for a lot of a lot mm -hmm. of these operations. Yeah, I know that was f that was for me one of the big feelings when I started in visual effects was that I thought it was going to be really rewarding to have my name in the credits. Um, I, I, we, we were a small studio and I didn't get my name in the credits, so I didn't even get that. But I could still sit in the film and say I worked on this shot. Um, but what I felt like. I was doing was creating the popcorn of life and then didn't have a lot of substance to it. And that let me led me to pursue other things. And I mean, it's all about personal fulfillment, but um, it's, I feel like there's, you, you have to be like, listen to your heart and listen to yourself and say, are you fulfilled? Like, are you ultimately fulfilled with this? And if someone says no, but I do 3d as a career. So I, so I can push the buttons and spend time with my family and, and not hate life. Th that's fine. I can appreciate that standpoint. But if you're not feeling fulfilled and, and you want to be fulfilled by your career or your art forms, like make a change. You do it. Yeah. If people can be accepting of it, you know, and I, I, there's nothing wrong with that. Like you said, absolutely nothing wrong with it. But I would hope that the, the higher percentage of people are really in pursuit of um, pushing the boundaries. And that's what certainly what, um, kept me going through all of those long late nights and uh, hard hard briefs and all of the time where you sort of know that you're ultimately working on really not what you should be getting financially <laughs> but um, be satisfied by what you're ultimately creating and so um, yeah it's 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 worth pursuing I certainly feel like I, there have been times I could have, have fallen on the wayside and sort of thought that really it's not really satisfying enough, but um, to sort of pop out the other side and, and be working on some really nice projects and um, I, I have a great team behind me to, to keep um, being advised by and, and, and working with it is really very satisfying. So hopefully that will continue for a long time and, um, and, and, and keep, pursuing the goals and beyond advertising that, you know, it'd be great to get involved in feature work and it would be great to continue the pursuit of, of the art work that I do and really just keep, um, keep plugging away and, and pick up jobs and, and do jobs 
on their credit, really, not on my financial requirements. And that's, um, it's a hard to get to that point. But once you're there, it's a very satisfying place to be. And I hope that that continues because um, it's been a battle. All right. Well, I think that's a perfect place to end this. Uh, any last words before we wrap up, Jake? Yeah, don't do it. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it right back to the beginning. I love it. <laughs> no, no, definitely do do it. But um, uh, keep your head about you and make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons. I think that's really the, the main thing I would say. Perfect. Well, once again, I want to invite people to go to brava.com. That's B-R-U-V-V-A.com and check out uh, some of the awesome – like it's it's just a great website. I, I love what you've done. I feel like the website itself is one of the best websites to display, uh, especially if your artwork is in video format. It's just amazing. Like it's a really it's it's a really nice model to look at of what you can do. Uh, so I congratulate on you on that and um, check it out. And if you're interested in learning and interacting with more artists, come check us out at pencilkings.com, uh, where we connect professionals with people learning visual art. So thanks a lot, Jake. I really appreciate it and the insight that we had in this conversation. It is really great. Thanks, Mitch. Been a pleasure.